Greetings, wonderful deep diver. Shout out to everyone who's here. We're not going to waste any time. We've got a very special guest, 19 Keys, Jibriel Mohammed, 19 Keys, entrepreneur, thought leader, author. Thank you so much for taking time out of your busy schedule, brother. Thank you for having me on your platform. Yes, yes. And we're going to talk about new earth, ancient wisdom, building wealth and the right food diet. But first of all, brother, let me commend you on all the work you've been doing. I've been watching your high level conversations. Phenomenal. Thank you very much, man. I appreciate that. You know, we just work to get the truth out there to the people. Yeah, definitely. Because it's so hard. It's so hard to get consciousness to go mainstream. And you've done it. You've made it popular. You've made it go viral. How did you do it, brother? I believe I'm a, I'm part of the collective consciousness that's always working to get it to the masses. Um, and I believe that, you know, anytime you come after so many great figures and people who have, you know, worked tirelessly to get this message out there, you get to learn, right, and innovate in new ways. And we now have new tools, right, um, to be able to push out these type of messages. And so for me, you know, I'm a student of innovation. I'm a student of design. I'm a student of the arts. So I want to always make sure that people take consciousness as a luxury. So what I decided to do was package it as a luxury, right? We are a desire-based society. So we sell it as is something of a desire, even though it's a need, right? And so when you understand the times that you're living in, then anything you put out can be in time and on time, right? And when you do that, the right idea at the right time equals success. That's the formula. Definitely, definitely. How did this whole journey start for you? What led you uh, to this path? Because this this journey is a journey that starts from my childhood, to be honest. You know, I think a lot of people, they get conscious this later on in life. Um, I started off with it as a child. You know, I just did an event out here in Oakland, California, you know, um, and it was good to see because there was some people from my childhood here. And this is my first time doing an event in my own city right, that I'm from, and it was people that grew up with me that were introduced to God at an early age, but I can honestly say I'm one of the only people who actually stuck with it and produced something from it, right, and, you know, sometimes I look at history and the vast amount of things that happen, it can be thousands and tens of thousands of people there, there can be a whole organization, and sometimes that organization and everything that happened was to inspire one person, right? You can have 40, 50 years of events that may have happened so that one person can get it, right? And, you know, we always talk about God works in mysterious ways and it's mysterious if you don't understand, right? The way the universe works, the way cause and effect works. And so, you know, from a child, I would be on stages speaking about social issues and impact and we were taught that we were gods from an early age and the development of that throughout life, right? From being in the streets, from catching court cases, um, it was a duality that we lived, right? And so I'm glad I was able to get both experiences because it gave me the necessary, right, um, perspective to be able to teach people at all different levels, right? So I've, I've done a lot of different things in life but along those paths, I've never put down consciousness. I've always wanted that to be a part of my journey. And I know that it was a part of my destiny to do what I'm doing today. Right, right. And we're living in crazy times, beautiful times. So much is happening. The ancients yeah, called it the quickening right now. <laughs> Definitely. The quickening. That's a word that I've been utilizing a lot lately, actually, because things are speeding up. But if, if you learn how to increase your speed and your velocity, then things start to slow down again. So as, as we enter into um, new paces, new dimensions, right, new speeds, because and this is a way for the average person to understand through technology, right? There's 1Gs, 2Gs, 3Gs to 5Gs to 6Gs to 10Gs. That lets you know the speed right, of the technological ages that we're in and our ability to process. And each time there's a new speed, a new processing power, there's new technology and new consciousness that can now be ciphered through that power. 
right? And through that speed and that dimension. And so we have to become multidimensional beings if we're living in this reality that is multimodal and this reality that has sped up to new paces and new realities. We're living in the everything reality right now where everything is happening all at once like the movie. Right, right. And, and I talk about New Earth. I talk about the fifth dimension. You know, I talk about some people already there. Some people already been yeah. there <laughs> from back Absolutely. in 2012. You know, people are just catching up. You know, people have been there for so long. They're just in Nirvana right now, waiting for everybody else to catch up, you know. And, and yeah. what does New Earth look like to you? Are we already in New Earth right now or are some people in New Earth? Because a lot of people talk about a split happening between 3D and 5D. I think we're at the precipice of, of it happening, but I think we're at the building phase of the tools to make it happen, right? We're in the building phases of the people who will make it happen, but we haven't crossed that threshold, right, to actualization. We're in a phase of a new world, but not a new earth, right? A new world is the collection of ideas, habits, rituals, processes, practices, egregores that people operate off of, right? But the new earth has not been terraformed yet by the tools and the leaders of the future that will create it. And so we're in the midst of those new leaders and those new creators and engineers and bioengineers and practitioners being formed. And so that's a good thing for everybody who's listening because you realize that you can be one of the new leaders of the new earth, right? And for me, that new earth is a representation of what we build out from our consciousness. Right. Earth responds to the consciousness of human beings. The resonant field responds to consciousness. Right. And so as we talk about a new Earth, it's representing a new mind on planet Earth and then Earth responding to those human beings. But a new Earth, it will look like a mesh between an old Earth. Right. With new technology, because when I say that, if we're talking about finding ways to, you know, cure the Earth from you know, the human plague of toxicity and, you know, uh, uh, um, uh, greenhouse gases and the effects of technology throughout the ages and our greed, then we're talking about cleaning the Amazon forests, cleaning the air, you know, creating new forestry, right? And living in tune with nature rather than setting aside nature so that we can build, right? It's learning how do you you know, it's kind of like looking at the airports where they have waterfalls and they have trees on the inside versus this dead structures that we build and all the trees are on the outside. Right. And so we have to learn how to bio and geo engineer with the earth instead of around the earth or push it out. Right. And that's when capitalism is not the main consciousness on the planet Earth. Right. Right. You know, I saw you on Drinks Champs. Shout out to Nori. And master build, master build. I love how you talk about wealth building. I love how you talk about uh, how you invest in crypto, everything you're doing with a blockchain. And for some people listening, how important is it to realize that we came here to live in abundance? Because a lot of people feel that once you've got some knowledge, you're supposed to be a poor, righteous teacher. But how is abundance linked to spirituality? And should we should we be living in abundance like totally? Absolutely. The anything anything that's not abundant is poor. Right. That's how I want us to think about it. Right. Do you want to live in a poverty based mindset or you want to live in an abundant reality? Right. The lack comes from the entity of fear because fear is an entity. It becomes a God when you allow anything that you fearful of becomes God. That's why many religions would tell you to fear God, right? Because now you fear the wrath for not following his will, which is more doing good. And the judgment day is the idea of when you're going against good, your own good nature, right? Then that's when you feel the wrath of self, right? So that's why many people are in the battle of their own conscience. So when we talk about living in abundance, you know, if we go back to comedic, you know, spirituality, you're talking about the Ma'atic law, right? Truth, order, justice, right? And in the end, Ma'at puts your, you know, your sins and they weigh them, you know, with the feather in the go in the heart. And for me, if Ma'at was weighing, right, my good and my bad, I would want my good to greatly outweigh my bad, 
right? So I get, you know, extra VIP passes into the so-called hereafter or however you want to hypothesize what happens next to us, right? But it's the same thing on earth. Wealth is the abundance of assets over liabilities, right? If you have an equal amount of liabilities versus an equal amount of assets, right, then you're balanced, right? Right, right. So, you know, that's like saying that I have $100 in income and I have $100 in debt, right? That income balances out that debt and now you have zero. So do you want balance or do you want abundance? Well, I have 100000 right? And I have $100 in debt, right? So guess what? Now I have wealth, right? So it's the same thing with happiness, right? It's the same thing with joy, right? I, don't, I, I want, it's the same thing with anxiety and depression, right? You don't want, you know, 50% of your life filled with anxiety, the other 50% filled with joy. No, that anxiety can come at a one to 10% rate, maybe and the other 90% I'm joyously living. So it's about living in the abundance of your higher self, right? Versus in the lack of your lower self. Right, right. Definitely, definitely. And for people who are listening who say, hey, I want to I want to be rich. I want to build wealth. What are some of the tips you can give people just to build wealth? Just what's helped you along your journey? Build the habits of wealth, not the goals. Goals do not complete anything. Goals, you know, are if it can be an illusion, it can be a wish without execution. So number one, always start with stop making goals and start making habits, right? So when we think about what are wealth habits, right? You know, a number one wealth habit, I think is number one, ha writing down, you know, your goals when it comes to money, right? So let's say a person wants to make $100,000 and then fractionalizing and breaking that down, right? You can't have a goal for something you don't know what you're going to trade for, it, right? So whether it's intellectual property, whether it's time, whether it's a skill set, whether it's a product that you're going to sell, right? The wealthy have plans, right? They don't just have dreams and goals. They write it down and then they mm. execute on a step-by-step -step basis. So I education, education is necessary if anybody wants to achieve. I studied the wealth standard of the Jewish community, the Chinese community, the Asian rather, um, the Hispanic community, the Amish, everybody. And what I find as a uh, thread that links everybody is education, right? The constant learning. Then we look at the top sectors that are evolving and you always into those top sectors. And right now it's technology, right? Um, but specifically, we go back to education, we talk about financial literacy, right? And so financial literacy allows you to set up your income and set up your assets in a way to where you're compounding interest and compounding over time. One of the number one ways that people build wealth is through businesses and investing, right? A person that has spending habits but no investing habits will always be poor, right? So if you have investing habits, which means that you're always finding assets that's going to give you a return on your money, right? So now whether you're investing your money during this time in gold, whether it's cryptocurrency, whether it's tech stocks, right? AI is a big thing. So, you know, people are afraid of the future. Well, invest in the future. So at least you get a piece of it, right? So right, go right. invest in Microsoft, right? Go invest in NVIDIA that builds the chips. So... You know, for me, having the habits and the education of a wealthy person builds wealth because that's the habits of wealth, right? Right, Understanding, right. setting up life insurance, setting up a trust, you know, setting up your life in a manner where it's about flow and it's about growth. So financial literacy is number one for anybody that want to make money, but then also leveraging your IP and developing skill sets that can pay you. Great, great, great. Well said. We're in the middle of an economic crisis. We've just seen Silicon Valley Bank go down, Credit Suisse. Uh, Robert Kiyosaki was on Fox News saying how a banking collapse is imminent and you should invest in gold and silver. You know, yeah, hero, Robert rich dad, poor dad. So I always listen to him. What do you think about this banking collapse? Because a lot of people, you know, they keep money in the bank. And then, you know, we're hearing about all of these banks collapsing all around the world. Bank of Lebanon, all, o all over the world. Like, yeah. What's happening? Well, the thing about banks, um, you know, it, it, it's inevitable, right? We are at this place where interest rates are extremely high. And when you understand the trickle effect of interest rates between bonds and borrowing and banks and 
then you start to understand we're in the perfect storm for banking collapse, right? And this is not the first time we go through paradigm shifts when it comes to the financial industry, right? These things happen in paradigm shifts, but the beautiful thing about it is they're pretty predictable, right? When one bank collapse, you can kind of follow the bread tr- the, the breadcrumbs to see what happens next. So we get a contagion effect. People lose faith in the bank's Then they have bank runs. And the rule of thumb for bank runs is don't be the last one. That's when everybody's afraid that the bank can't cover their deposits. So they try to bring their money out. So you're not the last one where the bank can say, oh, actually, we ain't got no more money now. Right. Because if you understand banks, they take your money and then they essentially go trade or invest your money, make money on top of your money and give you a fraction of the percentage of interest from the profit that they earn, which means your money is normally not in the bank. Right. So. 70, 80, 90% of your money is out there, right? Working for whoever owns that bank. So the banking industry is in a serious rut right now. And with the feds not turning on the money printer, right? Um, it's putting them in serious danger. And if you understand that FDIC, they don't insure all of the money in the bank. They only insure up to $200,000, right? So what we're seeing with this banking um, industry is number one, the sentiment of society towards banks is more important than whatever is going on because money is a collective illusion, right? We agree to the social construct of money. This has value, right? Because we all agree that it has value. This has $100, we agree to that, right? But we're living in a time of inflation, right? On the blockchain, there's something called trueflation which, which tracks the real data to where you can see it's about maybe around 4 to 5% right now, right? And the feds want to get that down around three to two percent. But most people don't think inflation is going to come down again. Well, that leaves the banks in trouble. So you have a lot of these small banks, right, that aren't too big to fail. So these banks are the first ones that people are pulling their deposits from, right? Institutions are pulling money from. So that means that people are going to be putting money into these bigger banks that are too big to fail, right? That can basically cover I mean, hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of billions of dollars, right? That centralizes the banking industry even more, right? But if hyperinflation happens and the um, CTO, uh, former CTO of Coinbase put out a bet that, you know, Bitcoin will go to a million dollars in 90 days, right? Now, in that scenario, if it was to happen, that means that hyperinflation has happened in the United States. Inflation has ran over. The dollar is not worth anything. There's complete lack of trust in the dollar. And so people are putting money in Bitcoin, which drives the price up. There's less than 21 million Bitcoin that will happen. So people will say, put it into Bitcoin, a diversified, put it into gold. Gold is the number one agreed upon global hedge in the world, right? When it comes to the monetary system, then you got other commodities such as silver, palladium, right? Oil and a bunch of other different things that if you put your money in or bonds, that your money will be safer in to get you a guaranteed return to be able to control your purchasing power. Now, I know I just said a lot, right? <laughs> but We're soaking it all in, brother. If you stop and you think about everything that I said, you really want to take key words like, you know, and this is why you, as you listen to somebody talk about things that you perhaps don't know, you ask questions in your own head. Like, okay, what is purchasing power and why is that important, Right. Why is it important not to have money in the smaller banks versus the bigger banks, right? What is the contagion effect, right? What is a hedge, right? These are very important when you're talking about the future of currency. It's not about you. Okay. Greetings, brother. Greetings, greetings, family. Deep dive. Can, can you hear me? Back. Yes. I can. Okay. You can hear me. That's fantastic. You know, I say you're dropping so much truth. Um, Powerful, powerful. Please continue where you were. Um, let, let's go from there. The chat are loving your wisdom. Loving your wisdom. Uh, blessings. I'm glad I could be here. Oh, yeah. Powerful. So so where we where we at now? Yes. Yeah, so so we, we were just talking about uh, the banking system and really, you know, investing in gold or silver, not being so dependent on all of the financial institutions that have been in existence for so long because times are changing right now on the planet. <laughs> Absolutely. And, 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 and so like, you know, we have a program, um, 
I partner with these guys named Acre Boys, and what they do is they basically help people buy land. So they can help you source land deals to sell because land is another valuable thing as well. They're not making any more land. So land is always a place where you can find your wealth, right? So historically, like, you know, land, life insurance, precious metals such as gold, of course, you know, and now the new age cryptocurrency. And then, of course, investing in stocks has always been, you know, a great thing as well. Uh, so these are the areas. And, and then, of course, entrepreneurship, right? Like for me, we are entering in a phase of the great de-skilling of America, right? right? The skills that people have right now won't be worth much in the future. So there's a lot of people who are outdated. Let's just say that. It's like if you have an outdated phone and your phone hasn't learned anything new and it can't process the broadband width of current internet speeds, right, then that phone is outdated. So there's a lot of people who are outdated for the new speed of society, right? So their education is outdated and you can't go to school because things are speeding up so fast. The people that would be valuable enough that have the expertise to teach you will not be sitting in the classroom teaching you. They will be out there working for themselves. So that forces everybody to become their own boss and become their own leader, right? We are in a time where people are becoming more followers than ever. Than ever. But I'm into positive defiance. We have to change the narratives to where the most important, for me, one of the most important titles that a person can take beyond this job title that you get, because those titles are not worth anything now that AI can do it. Become a leader. AI can become a leader, right? Once you become a leader, whether you are a boss, a CEO, whether you're an engineer, whatever it is, you are someone in the field that can lead others, right? And so taking on that mindset, you putting yourself in place to win regardless of what's happening, because leaders always win. They're always in the lead, right? That's the whole key. So I want people to take on the energy and the mindset of a leader because now that means that you are the one that is always inspiring. You are the one that is always leading by example, right? So I'll get back because somebody asked me to continue to talk about the land thing, but I start talking, I start working with a lot of different people and creating great collaborations. And one of them is with my brother's Acre Boys and what they do is they teach people how to find land deals. So you can find land deals. They have deals where they can find it under like $30. And you can get this land in your possession and you can sell it to somebody else that wants land for like $3,000. So you can get a deal for, you know, however it ranges. Or you can keep the land for yourself. So they have all of these different ways to give people new skills. So you may have been a, a train engineer. You may have been you know, a script writer, you may have been whatever you were before, but now we have to equip ourselves with new skills. Like how do we buy and sell land so that we can make money? And this can be a skill set you sit at home, but you knew nothing about yesterday, right? So it's updating yourself with new skills, not new dreams, right? And I think that's important to note because society sells you dreams, right? But dreams don't produce success. Skills produce success. Right. So yes. they tell you to dream big, skill big, get a skill set that you can be autonomous with, that you can take anywhere in the world. Get a skill set that's future proof and recession proof. Right. If you learn how to trade options. Right. That's a skill set that can become recession proof. Right. And so skill big. Don't just dream big. Right. Habit big. Come out with better habits. Right. So, you know. There's Warren Buffett just bought Barrett Gold. He didn't just invest in it. He bought the whole company. <laughs> Warren Buffett doesn't just buy things for no reason. He said in the future, where's the arbitrage? Where's the value? And he bought it. So what ended up happening is, is you don't understand the move now because he's not making a move for now. He's making a move for the future. So if you don't have long-term thinking, you can't even appreciate the art and the skill of investing, Right. Because investing is, is understanding the pattern and the flow of the future, right? So when you look at your life now, ask yourself, not what's valuable for me now, what's valuable for my future self, mm, right? That's powerful, what that's currency, powerful. What currency will my future self need? Not my current self, because we're so selfish, right, that we set our future self up for failure. 
our future self, like, how come I don't own 20 Bitcoin? Oh, because my past self didn't invest. Your right, current self, right. like, how come I don't own kilos of gold? Oh, my past self spent it on every blunt that he smoked. Dang. Right, past right. self is always selfish because, and, and this is where we dive deep. You know what I mean? Deep divers. Rock with me. Deep Blue. divers, Blue. baby. This is what I want you all to understand. The version that you are right now, you are, you know, there's a um, there's a story about the ship Theseus. And the story goes that if you were to take a ship and it's a wooden ship, right? And he, over time you replace every plank on that ship, right? And every wood panel on that ship over time, is it still the same ship? That's the thought experiment. Think about that, right? Because we talk about continuity Right, and we talk about renewing ourselves, right? There's an idea that the person that you, the, the life that you live in right now, present self, is not the same person, literally, and I mean this in a very real sense. You're not the same person that you was. Time is a dimension within itself. Right? So myself in nineteen ninety nine is not the same person that I am now. I'm a different dimension. Right, a completely different dimension than I am now. I couldn't make decisions for the person that I am now. But if I did, but I was selfish because I can only live the life of my time period. But now I realize that I'm living the life of all of my multidimensional selves. So if I'm not selfish, then I want to set them up because I can enjoy the experience of the moment and say, you know what, YOLO. But then when you wake up in the morning, your future self has to have that headache. Right. Yes. So it's like you're always jumping into new bodies and new dimensions. And that person has to live the experiences right of all of the decisions that you made. And they may have felt good at that moment. And you feel like, well, I get to enjoy it now. I'm the present self. I ain't got to worry about it. Future self got to deal with that. So then you wake up with a headache or you broke and you like, damn, my past self, this is how they treated me. <laughs> right, right, so right. We have to think about it in those terms of not being selfish for our future selves because we have to live that life and we and share this life with multi-dimensional versions of ourselves definitely definitely i mean you're dropping so many jewels right now we're loving it let's go back to ancient Kemet or egypt you know i used to go by the name of Kemet prince one my awakening actually okay. began with the great author anthony t browder i'm not sure if you've heard of him he wrote the book now valley contributions to civilization Absolutely, of course. And, and of course. you know, he, he's a master teacher in his own right. So that's how I started to wake up. Once I realized that it all came from ancient Egypt, it was a wrap. And I know you just came back from Egypt. What was that like, brother? Man. <laughs> you know, I, just, uh, <laughs> I just had a high-level conversation with um, a Kemetologist, man, a, a Kemet master. He was the uh, father of the Ankh, is what we call him, because he was the first person to bring the Ankh to America, right, in the 50s, in the 60s. And his name is Baba Haru. And so we had a long three, it was still part of the longest high-level conversation that I've shot this far, and it was all about Kemet. Um, and when I went to Egypt, what is now known as Egypt, you know, Kemet was a representation of the land of the blacks. That's what Kemet means. And because the soil was so rich is what actually allowed them to have great agriculture and feed the people. Right. But when I was out there, what I learned specifically, even about economics and why they were able to have systems and what we admire the most about Egypt. And what most people don't think about is their ability to have unity and unify systems of thought over courses of time. So when we think about time, in America, or we go back to European colonization and, and conquering, we would look at, you know, um, instead of conquering, you know, spaces, they learn how to conquer times, right? Conquer spaces is limited and it always expires. So it's like somebody on a block, yo, this is my space, stay off my street. Where somebody started to think, no, I need to conquer time. This is my next 10 years. This is my next 100 years. So they started to write down and put things on papyrus, right? Paper, their plans and their ideas, right? And then people after them followed it throughout time, right? The, because the, 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 the paper is actually the greatest incantation, right, ever to it, it exist. It's where we didn't just speak things into existence. We were able to 
ritualize and write things into existence, right? And that's where we was able to manufacture the crystallization of thought and pass that on, right, as egregor rituals. So, you know, the ancient comedic people and the Egyptians understood this power. So one thing that they understood greatly is the, the, the power of understanding, you know, um, the stars, the cosmology, and understanding agriculture, and understanding the river, and the connection between agricultural times and when it's time to harvest. And so by studying that, they were able to feed their people. And by feeding their people, the people were then able to become unified in the collective consciousness to bring out the thoughts of building the great civilizations that we now marvel at. But if you can't feed the people, right, then we can't bring out any unified collective consciousness because we're worried about the small, low-level details, eating and shelter, right? So this is where we're at right now. So in Egypt, I learned that lesson is that we're in a rat race, right? So we can't get in the God race, right? Because we're worrying about things that God would not worry about, which is food, clothing, and shelter, right? And so and they solved that problem for their people, right? And that's when they was able to actualize things that we can't do today because we have too much poverty, right? right and so right. the... The thing that I admired the most, you know, I went to go visit uh, Karnat, which is one of the most oldest ancient religious sites in the world. And each, you know, um, king and pharaoh added to Karnat as they existed as their lineage. So they would build something and the next coming and they would build something. So it was built over time. And that's the beautiful thing about Egypt is everything that you see was built over time. It wasn't right, one right. ruler. It was a continuation of ideas that were then installed, right? And you know, one of the most famous, one of the most famous um, pharaohs of that time was the 19-year-old king, you know, Tutankhamun. You know, and, and, and we had the great ability to go visit him, and you know, his body was still there on display. And this is how you know these were Africans, because only Africans get dug up and put on display. We don't see that happen in no other parts of the world where the bodies and the bones are then put on display, right? We only do that for us. It's like a, a afterlife crucifixion, you know? But when I looked at the walls there in, in, in Egypt, it was all brown people with braids and nappy hair. And, you know, they were practicing yoga and comedic sciences and technology. And it was like, wow. I don't need a history book. I don't need a scholar. I don't need anybody to tell me who these people were. The evidence is in front of me. Only a people that wants to rewrite history need a scholar to tell them that, am I seeing what I'm seeing is real? It's only because you don't like what you're seeing. Some right? people say, you know, <laughs> Egypt was the golden age, you know, of milk and honey. Um, the two questions arise, how did they fall? And the next question, how can we get back up to that level? Is it possible to, because till this day, they still can't build pyramids. They can't build the Great Pyramid. Pe people don't know who, how, how they were able to build the Great Pyramids, you know. And right now, I know energy can never be destroyed. You know, the gods are still walking amongst us. What's stopping us right now from doing the same thing that they were doing thousands of years ago? What's the missing link right now? Well, I would say, like I said, the first thing is we can't, you can't, listen, they call those people slaves, which comes from the Slavic people, the Slavs, right? And our idea of slavery is completely different because we look at chattel slavery and we like, oh, those people were beaten and raped and tortured. No, that's not what was going on, right? Those people were in servitude and in debt to their country because they were feeding these people and housing these people. And they lived a life, right, that is greater than most people that's living in poverty in America today. And so by solving the poverty problem, solving the housing problem, they focus on the Great Pyramid, like Maslow's Law, right? When you can solve that problem of, you know, food, clothing, and shelter, and they're not in a rat race, they can get to actualization, right? We have uh, an advancement of, you know, technology today, but it's spiritual technology that's missing. There are certain things human beings cannot do unless they're unified. 
there's certain things that human beings cannot do until we get rid of poverty, right? We can't, it's certain, like civilizations cannot rise higher than this woman, right? That's just a fact. Teach, right, so right. When, when there was myotic law of the land, that was a recognition of patriarchal and matriarchal, right? There was there was Oset, Osiris, there was Maat, there was Isis, right? In America, in these systems that we have today, there is no recognition of the woman, right? And so unification of the human family is a technology within itself that manifests as different realities, right? And so we thinking about outer technologies that, oh, I wonder what the Egyptians had. They had unity, right? We have to think about what problems do we solve and how does that free up human beings to do things that we never could do? Because we're putting so much mental energy into solving the problems and trying to correct the issues that we can't even get to the reality of the new earth, right? right so right. old earth looks better than new, than, than present earth because they didn't have the same problems. Right, right. Well, we can talk about, um, you know, I talk about the inorganic ones as a force which wants to stop people from waking up. And I know a lot of um, melanated people, especially in America, you know, um, are, are fast asleep once they wake up it's over <laughs> because yeah, because it, it's it's a case where a lot of their energy you know it's on a low frequency a low vibration but the moment they get that knowledge it's over and right um i truly feel music is is one of the most powerful mediums you know and and shout out to nipsey hustle you know because you know, I used to live in L.A., so I would always go past his store and, and what he was doing was groundbreaking. Yeah, okay. What he was doing was revolutionary because he was on a whole nother wave, whole nother frequency, investing back into the community, teaching people about crypto, building wealth. And, you know, that laid the blueprint for people to follow, you know. Yeah. And when we take a look around, at, you know, the music, how, how do you feel? Um, I love how you were connecting with Kyrie Irving you know, and, and showing that unity, you were supporting him. I remember when no one else was, you know, and, and that yeah. really was powerful because, you know, I saw that in the news, like, wow, you know, 19 keys standing by Kyrie, everyone else was going against him, you know, but that unity yeah. was so powerful. Um, how do you feel um, celebrities and, and musicians can play a part in the great awakening? What kind of power do they hold? to shift this whole thing around because some, some of them got 100 million followers 200 million followers like beyonce all of these people is it their job to kind of inspire or are they just there to do whatever they want to do do they have a responsibility or, or they should just live their life you know I, I, that's a great question that you pose everybody that considers themselves good have a responsibility to do good um nobody gets um, the rule of exception, in my humble opinion. The Honorable Minister Louis Farrakhan once said that when a rap song is more powerful than a thousand sermons, right? And I've truly believed that because music has the ability to transform the soul. It has the ability to program the mind in a subconscious way to manipulate the waters of the human being from a lower consciousness to a higher consciousness or from a higher to a lower state. We study binaural beats, so we understand the effect that they can have on the mind and taking it to different states of consciousness. So entertainers, you know, if you were to look at entertainers, what people looked at a lot of times, right, um, entities as gods in old days, why? Because they have the ability to possess and ritualize the minds of the people. But the problem is, is that a lot of the entertainers do not work for the good, right? A lot of entertainers today start off with the arts, but they work for the bad, right? And by bad, I mean they work for just capitalism. They don't care about the human condition of life, but they're using tools, right, that literally shape the vibration of human life and consciousness. So if entertainers in the, in the entertainment community and all our great creators learn how to embed, you know, the frequency of consciousness and higher consciousness rather in righteousness into their music. And they could spark 
the new earth that you speak about, right? Because they can raise the consciousness of the whole planet earth. Case in point, hip hop exports death. No society can change and build unless the culture that they're building on top of is correct. So we have a death culture. We have a, a sex, death, money, drug, ego culture. All of these things are or can be low vibrational, right? And the way that they're spoken about and the way that they're detailed in um, large commercial hip hop today, right, is used to manipulate the minds into lower states of consciousness so that they can be stuck in their desires so that they can now be turned into consumers for capitalists. This has been happening in America since the days of Edward Bernay pioneered um, public relations and he found ways to sell people things that they didn't need. So he, he was the pioneer of bacon and getting women to smoke cigarettes. Right, right. right. And so that was manipulating the consciousness to make people think that these things were something aspirational for them or these things were in some sort of connection to freedom or power or anything. And instead he got people to desire things that they didn't need. So the musicians have the ability to reverse the effect of the program, right? Because this is a state of suggestibility when we are listening to music and frequency, then they can now suggest and embed thoughts that cure the stress, anxiety, and depression, and suicidal tendencies that human beings have today because we're being over, you know, filled with, you know, these signals and these messages and negativity on a daily basis. So I think it's important that they take on the role and the responsibility to re-engineer the mind if they consider themselves to be good people, right? Otherwise, it's going to be up to other leaders to steer the direction of, wait a minute, there are beautiful creators and there's a beautiful community, right, of creators that actually do put out great message and put out great production behind the message, which is important. So Definitely. That's when we listen to the Kendricks, we listen to the Coles, we listen to the Bashir musics and the Jack Hellers and the La Russells, and we listen to people that put out good messages and we magnify that so that becomes the sound that the generations right are growing up to which allows them to grow into right and so i think that is a two-part relationship don't expect the devil to do god's job mm. that's a slow motion definitely that was we powerful definitely definitely you know as i see it um, you know, I've been sharing for a while, you know, and, and, you know, I've got videos, I've got 6 million views, 5 million views, you know, gone mega viral, you know, and, and what I see is that, um, you got to be the glitch in the matrix, you know, because I feel sometimes even when you're awakening, sometimes you feel I can't make it to the mainstream. And I feel that's a program people have to delete because anybody can do it, you know, and and what what I know though is that um, there is a force on this planet. I call them the inorganic ones, who never take a day off. Like Bob Marley said, they never take a day off, and their job is to make sure the planet is in low frequency. So therefore, what happened to Lauren Hill? She was replaced with Cardi B. You see, so I can see there's an agenda because I say, hey, there's great musicians who are still here. It's just that that music is getting suppressed. And there are so many people out there who have so many talents, but instead you're seeing what they want you to see to keep you distracted. So how do people override that? Because it's real, <laughs> you know, it's real. When it comes to being the glitch in the matrix, you got to look at the matrix, right? Um, what did Neo do? Right. And, and we talk about mainstream Right. So the mainstream is basically the largest stream. Right. It's where most things flow from to the masses. So that's what mainstream is. Right. Mainstream is where most things stream to the masses. So a lot of people connotate mainstream. That's just all what it's talking about. It's the largest stream to get things out there. Right. So when we're talking about mainstream, you're talking about 
being the most effective. Because if you can put your message, it's like if if, if you wanted to uh, put fluoride in a river, right, um, that's going to be a stream that's going to reach a particular town, right? But if you put it into an ocean, right, then that may be the mainstream that reaches the world, right? And so we're working to have the reverse, the anti-fluoride, right? We're working to put the consciousness into the mainstream. And in order to do that, that means there are gatekeepers to that stream. You can't just walk up to it and be like, yo, I want to I wanna put some higher consciousness right, in here. Can right. I drop this into the ocean? No. They have gatekeepers that want to allow you behind to walk in that door. So instead, you have to be a strategist today. Right? And then there's ways to circumnavigate the gatekeepers because they don't have every part of the border secure. Right? So this mainstream can be infiltrated because technology created more doors and there's not gatekeepers for every doorway. Right? <laughs> Definitely. So what we learn to do is to be strategic and find where there's no gatekeepers at or where the gatekeepers don't realize where you become a spook who sat beside the door and or you collaborate with somebody, right, who has access that the gatekeepers trust. And you say, OK, I'm going to collaborate with them. The gatekeepers trust them. Then when I'm going to rock with them, if I go in on a pass, now I get behind the doors. Now I can drop right? My jewels into the mainstream, right? And now people are like, yo, how did they get this in the mainstream? It's not that the gatekeepers have changed. No, it's that we strategized to find a way to get past the gatekeepers, or we found a doorway that there was no gatekeepers at. And right, so our right. generation gets to understand that we are the generation that gets to create our own doorways and our own pathways to embed things into the mainstream consciousness. And that's what I've been doing for a long time. I'll give you an example, a real example. I was on a breakfast club, right? Um, I would have never gotten on the breakfast club if I didn't have a collaboration and partnership with my brothers from Iron Your Leisure because they had a deal to get on the breakfast club so many times, right? And one of those times was going to be used for me because this is part of our contract of working together, right? Right? So therefore, when they go up there, they have to let me up there because I'm coming with my brothers. So here are gatekeepers. I'm with somebody that has a pass to go right. beyond the gate. So now I'm there through strategy. It's not that they change and they don't see me as a threat or they know. It's that I create a strategy to get beyond the gate so I can put something in the mainstream. Right. And so when we think strategic, there are no gates. There are no barriers. There are no gatekeepers. There is only your thinking and which will get you to that next level, right? The highest level. And so once you become strategic, you learn the ways, right, of thinking. You learn the art of strategy. You learn the art of war, right? So that to me says that, no, it's not the devil's job to do the job of God. It's God's job to do that job. So I said, mm -hmm. let me execute while they continue to gatekeep. And they don't even realize that they can't gatekeep no more because we're going to kick that shit down every day. Powerful, powerful. What would you say your overall mission is right now along your journey? What are you living for? Are you living for yourself? Are you living for the community? Are you living to change the world? Or are you just being you? Um, there's a there's really a mixture of all of that, to be honest with you. Um, I'm a human being. I don't. I don't claim to be some great messiah. I don't claim to be anybody's savior. If anybody here gets value from me, beautiful. But if you don't like anything that I said, go study your own. Don't follow me. Be your own leader. Take your own information. I'm just a young man in the world that's learned how to use my own mind. Right. And I openly give the keys that I have on how I've been able to use my mind to the world. And as I do this, I realize that, you know, I have a responsibility um, to execute my destiny, right? And so my destiny is to bring a light, bring, to be a light bringer to the world, right? To deliver um, a level of consciousness to my generation, right? As there were people before me, but I couldn't exist if the people before me didn't exist. I learned from them. People like you regurgitated. Yeah, I'm gonna regurgitate truth all day long. I don't always need to have an original thought 
if I can get truth. Ego makes you think you have to create something else rather than give somebody just what they need, right? I don't need to brand things in my own special way, right? Unless I don't see something done in a way to where the solution already exists, right? So we're at this precipice of life now where everybody gets to actualize themselves, right? If you believe that your brand of teaching ideology and philosophy is best for the world, go out there and prove it, right? So what I'm doing is I'm demonstrating, that's all. I'm demonstrating what it's like to understand yourself, know yourself, right? And build yourself up in front of the world so I can inspire the world and bring some enlightenment to the world. And that's a beautiful thing because, you know, there was a time where I wasn't bringing light to the world. It was a time where I was living completely in my ego and in selfishness. And now my greatest joy, right, is bringing joy to others. So for me, the highest level of leadership is being a servant, servant leadership. You put people in position, you tell them what the mission and the vision is. And when people are ready, you serve them so that we can bring that into reality. So that's my goal today is to create more leaders on this earth. My goal today is to help establish new consciousness and new institutions and to use every ounce of energy that I have doing that, right? Because otherwise I will be fearful of the reality that, you know, my children and children's children or my nephews and nieces would have to live in. So we all have the responsibility to do something to create the world that we would want to live in and we want future generations to live in. You're doing a phenomenal job, brother. You know, I I know you have soul gold um, water. Oh, Is gold that, water. Gold water. Gold water. Let, let's yeah. talk about uh, the perfect diet. Let's talk about food and nutrition because I always say once you start to eat better, that awakening comes real fast. You know, once you start yeah. to, you know, uh, go alkaline. And, you know, Dr. Sabi was one, a pioneer who really brought that to the mainstream. You know, being connected to Michael Jackson and all of these uh Eddie Murphy, all of these famous celebrities. So um, for your, for yourself, you know, I don't know if you're plant-based, if you're, what do you feel is the optimum diet for a human being? Or do you think it varies depending on who you are and your level of consciousness? That's a great question. You know, um, our way of living has to vary per human being because we're all different, right? We are a customized group of people on this planet Earth. There's literally some people I know that if they go vegan, they get sick, right? Mm. So that lets me know that everybody is not meant to do the same thing. So when it comes to the way we eat, we have to have knowledge of self. I talked about it a little earlier that Edward Bernay was the pioneer of the bacon breakfast. Right. He connected it to a hearty breakfast, like eating good. So he literally connected pork bacon to health and breakfast in the morning. Right. And breakfast really came from drinking coffee. Right. The Muslims would actually drink coffee during Ramadan time. And that's really how it came out. Right. And then breakfast came as a, a later addition to coffee and then eating, right? Because that's what we're doing when we're adding minerals and we're adding food to our body. We're breaking that fast. And so, you know, once you learn the customization of self and you have knowledge of self, then you're eating based on your genetics, right? You're eating based on your biology, right? Living in America, we have an unfair reality because most of the things that we eat are not fresh and natural. So what I would tell one person in Africa to eat would be different because we also have to customize our circumstances and our access to nutrient available foods versus artificial foods, right? So for me, I always tell people I'm not vegan because vegan is a derivative of, you know, vegetarianism, but specifically it is... Uh, the, the, the man who created veganism had a love for animals, not a love for health, mm. right? So there's a lot of people who are vegan, but they're unhealthy, right? Because they don't care about themselves. They care about the animals. And then wow. there are some people who are vegan for the world. So they care about the climate, and they believe that they're doing their part by not eating animals and things of that nature. And then you have the people who consider themselves to be plant-based, Right? 
So these are the people who will only eat things that are naturally made by plants, right? And so you have the people who are eating for their health, right? And so when you eat for your health, you learn how to eat to live, right? And the Honorable Elijah Muhammad was the first person to give a nutritional guide and a disciplinary health regimen, right, specifically to black people in America, but it became an adopted, you know, um, education for the world where that's where you get intermittent fasting from, right? So he gave us groups of food to eat and groups of food not to eat. And from him, you get Dr. Sebi because Dr. Sebi learned directly from the Honorable Elijah Muhammad and he gave him credit for being the first teacher, right, of the correct diet during that time. So by studying Dr. Sebi, you know the alkaline diet, but the alkaline diet was a specific diet as well for people who were sick, right? And so you then had to take, you know, a way to heal yourself the same way a doctor is not going to suggest you eat red meats and porks and things of that nature while you're sick. They're going to give right. you a suggestion of food to eat so that you can heal. So when we eat to live and we learn to live to eat, the right way, then we start eating accordingly to what we need, not what we want, right? And so, you know, another part of the the living to eat is the digestion of sunlight, right? When when you understand that food, the reason we eat food is because of its intake of sun, right? So that sun informs the body. That that sun energizes the body. We need that radiation that the sun gets. There's certain we can't synthesize vitamin C, so we have to get it from eating particular fruits and vegetables. And, you know, we, 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 we can better synthesize vitamin D by being in the sun. So we wake up in the morning and being in connection with your circadian rhythm is better than being a person that say, oh, I'm vegan. But waking up at the right time is part of the diet. That's part of the lifestyle. So now you wake up with the sun and you're living the life like a plant would. Right. So that's going to make you live longer. Right. Then you just going to get impossible foods. <laughs> <laughs> right. So we have to learn that diet is a holistic practice. Right. It's a mental, it's a spiritual and it's a physical thing. And so if we want to live correctly, we have to live in alignment and coordination with nature and the planet Earth. And we have to live in alignment to the customization of self and our own particular needs. That was powerful. That was that was eye opening even for me because, you know, I've been plant based for over 18 years, you know, mm -hmm. but even I'm always open minded. I'm always open minded because, you know, I always say, what did your ancestors eat? You know, what did they eat at the dawn of time? You know, and we've got to remind ourselves, depending on where you were, if you were living in the sun, you might just eat a mango, a papaya and be good to go. You know, and a lot of people due to stress, they're eating junk food. So I always say, um, you know, I've interviewed a breatharian, you know, uh, in the summertime, sometimes you don't even need to eat. You just need to drink. And, and it's those, I love how you, you talk about Irish sea moss, you know, which is a superfood. And, and uh, how has that helped you along your journey? Yeah, you know, so it's funny because we call it gold water and people think like there are only... Um, product is gold water, which is collodial gold, which is a great product. I love collodial gold, right? Um, but we have all of these other nootropics that we have as well. So we greatly incorporate, you know, the mycelium network, right, within our diet. Um, so we utilize lion's mane, right? We utilize cordyceps, right? Um, and these are things that for me specifically, we have one, uh, it's called uh, Smart Moss, right? And Smart Moss is an incorporation of lion mane, cannabinoids, and um, sea moss, right? So we are an over-chemicalized society, an under-mineralized society, right? And we are, a, 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 you know, testosterone levels are at a 40-year low, right? The uh, estrogen levels for women are imbalanced, right? So this causes, you know, unnatural anxiety within the body. And it throws off the gut microbes as well within the body. So you can't think clear and or focus. So for me, as I teach people information, knowledge, and education, I also want to give you the proper supplement so that your brain can be able to intake this information, right? So by giving you the lion's mane, 
now you have what they call the, the myelination, the remyelination of the brain, right? Which is essentially regrowing that synaptic connection between the neurons in your brain. And that's what that lion's mane help add to, right? So mushrooms have profound effect on the mind. And it's to me, it's like a natural uh, Adderall, right? Without the side effects, right? It's Powerful. a Viagra for the brain. It's going to get your mind up, right? So, you know, I wanted to do the new tropics on purpose because those are things that I'm always seeking. While some people may, you know, they may smoke weed or do drugs or do depressive drugs. You know, I like things that feed my mind and help me grow, right? So I always, I'm always studying and learning. So memory and being mentally fit is very important for me, right? And then the cordyceps is something that I take when it's time to work out. Right. So the cordyceps mixed with the vitamin D, mixed with the zinc, right, mixed with the uh, the shrooms or, or the, the moss. You know, that's a combination of things that we put together because those are the things that the body is going to need that is not naturally getting to rebalance you. And then when you go in there and you're working out, it's giving you that kick and that rush and it's decreasing the time you're going to need for recovery as well through indicine triphosphate. So when you study these things, then you understand that, damn, we also have a manual to our body so we can know how to properly, you know, uh, um, program ourselves and get the best results out of ourselves. So before I work out, I'm going directly to my um, sports malls and I'm taking some of those. Right. I wake up in the morning. I need that gold water. So we got that. And then we just got pure organic sea moss as well, which is some of the best on the planet Earth. It's been tested and everything to make sure we got the best. And we have even more stuff that, you know, colloidal silvers and things of that nature. But like I said, it's all about mineralizing the body in an over society. <laughs> right? Right, right. So, you know, I got the silver on. I see somebody, they, somebody commented on the rings. <laughs> the thing I like about, I, listen, I got gold rings. My, my life is never in reaction to somebody else's triggers. I don't really care. Right. I, I, I put on Montezuma gold. I put on, you know, Monsa Musa gold and you can still be the exact same person. But I like to be connected to the to the uh, the minerals. Right. We got right. the silver on, we put the gold on and gold actually gets into your bloodstream. Right. By just by wearing the gold. You definitely. Did, which is a definitely. beautiful thing. And that's why yeah, I say, you know, even in the music gold. industry, you know, people will judge rappers for we for wearing gold, but that's what matters the most. That's what's worth the most right now, yeah. <laughs> you know. So we've always been attracted to that, you know. Yeah, put the gold on, put the crystals on, you know, tap into the elements, you know. I right. This is a sickness that we have in society by we focus on the wrong things, you know. Like it's it's beautiful when we learn how to focus on the right things and we learn how to. Um, you know, settle on the best part is what I was always taught, right? And each person, you're going to look at things that you don't like, and then you're going to look at things that you do. And we were taught to settle on the best part. That's the beauty of human connection, because that helps us unify consistently. I'm not looking at what I don't like in you. I'm looking at what I do like, because right there, that's, that's the value. So for right. me, that's the art of collaboration. Let's not talk about where we divided. Let's talk about where we united. Right. And, and that's why I reached out to you, brother, because, you know, I've been following your work and it's truly powerful. You know, I came up and uh, there were other content creators sharing. You know, I collaborated with them. And, you know, for me, I say we can take it, we can take it to a whole nother level if people just started to come together. I feel a lot of people who are waking up, who are awake or aware, you know, sometimes they can still be thinking they can do everything by themselves. But I always say wickedness works together. That's why it controls the world. You know, sometimes, <laughs> you know, Man, that's the thing that um you can learn. You know, they definitely know how to work together and they don't make excuses while we do the opposite. Right. 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 So we have to learn how to build together, how to work together. And there's a lot that we can learn, you know, from them because they have an aggressive approach at constantly maintaining power and controlling the world. And so we have to have that same approach when it comes to, you know, rebuilding our world in the image of, you know, uh, that crystallized uh, or that Christ consciousness. Right, right. And, and you know, when, when we talk of really where we are right now on the planet, you know, I know a lot of young people, I always say the youth hold the secrets. They hold the, the keys to the future. 
you know, and I feel what you're doing with your message, you're, you know, a lot of young people are lis- listening to you, you know, which is powerful because once you've got the youth, you know, change is going to happen. But at the yeah. same time, um, you're human and you're immortal at the same time and you have your own life at the same time, you know? So sometimes how do you deal with people sometimes approaching you? Oh, 19 keys, you know? And how do you deal with this? You know, like sometimes you just want to chill out, chill and eat with, you know, with your, with your wife or whatever. And how do you deal with people just coming up to you? I mean, um, sometimes expecting you to be perfect, to be this Messiah figure and, you know, when you're just you, you're authentic, you know? So I think a lot of times people expect people who are doing what you're doing and, to be some kind of like a holier than now figure when in actuality yeah, you're, uh, you're a spiritual gangster, you know? Yeah, that's, yeah, like that. <laughs> I, I'm, I'm definitely not no holier than thou figure. Uh, I'm a brother. I got seven brothers. You know what I mean? We laugh, we joke around, we live. Um, it's just, you know, my passion is, you know, growth. My passion is consciousness. But when it comes to dealing with people, I deal with people, uh, and, and and here's my thing. I don't try to be humble. I think it's one of those things like trying to be humble is 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 is, is fake to me. Um, I think where it comes from is I'm genuinely inspired by people who want to learn, right? And I think the beauty of the platform is I love when it's people who tapped in because they learned something and they was inspired and they're actively changing their life. Now, I can get annoyed like anybody. You feel me? Uh, and I do. Um, but at the same time, I try to keep my energies high where I'm not going around people unless my energy can handle it. Right. And I think that when you approach people in service and you approach people in openness, then it's hard for you to get, you know, anxiety and stress. And because I also realize I called this into existence. I can't ask for something. And then, you know, when I get the success, I'm mad at the success. So part of people walking up to me you know, in gratitude and the people is what make you who you are. So, you know, I'm appreciative of it because without the people walking up to me, without the people watching, without the people supporting, there is no platform. Right. So for people to get angry at the supporters, right, it's get angry at your own success. So, you know, I don't I don't suggest people just, you know, walking to me crazy or nothing because I'm still a man. So, you know, and I'm a masculine man at that. So I still check activities. But, yeah, I love it, though, man. I, I love the energy. You know, it ain't got to the point where I'm Michael Jackson and I'm walking around and people are chasing me. <laughs> you know? so right, right. still at a level where it's, uh, uh, I have the ability to contain it. Right. And, you know, as I see it in the community, um, you know, in the collective, um, everyone has a superpower. You know, in my mind, your superpower is, is really bringing this uh, wealth building to the forefront because I I didn't hear anybody talk about it like you did, you know, to the mainstream. Um, Someone like a Kevin Samuels was relationships, you know, because I would see what he was able to do. You know, he, he went mainstream, he cracked the algorithm. And uh, you know, when we talk of male and female relationships, a lot of people were like, Hey, I don't like Kevin Samuels, but they were tuning in and he's got so many supporters. And so he's so polarizing, you know, So what he highlighted in his shows for me was that there was a big, big disconnect between male and female relationships. Uh, You have the manosphere, you know, the red pill movement right now. You've got people like Andrew Tate, all of these people. What's your how do you feel this ties into consciousness? What's going on between males and females on the planet with the rise of feminism and everything? Uh, There's a tug of war going on right now. Um, You know, women... Women are meant to rise. And the one thing I will say is that we have to be careful on who's controlling or who's manipulating and taking advantage of this age of Aquarius right now, right? Because they know, if you understand the script of reality, you know women will rise. You know they will challenge the old world, which is a patriarchal based system in society. But you have to understand that the corporations understand that too, and they can manipulate, right? The feelings and desires of women. And I go back to Edward Bernay. Edward Bernay got women to smoke cigarettes. And he realized that the corporations came to him and say, listen, we missing half of our consumer base. And so he came up with this plan 
at this protest to have all these women have cigarettes in their stockings and at the same time they will stand up when the protest started and they'll start smoking. And that became, he made sure that the media picked it up and ran with the story and it became a symbol, the torchlight of freedom, right? Cigarettes became a torchlight of freedom and women connected that to, you know, um, a rebellion against man, right? So it became a connection between feminism and freedom, right? But in reality, it was causing cancer and death. Right? right. And so you have to be careful how our emotions and desires and want for liberation and freedom can be manipulated by the powers that be to understand human behavior and they will use it for their own capitalist goods. Right. And wants. And so I believe we're at that same point in time today where men and women are purposely being played against each other. And if you follow the trail of who benefits from it then you can see who's pulling the strings of the masses. So women that are attracted to men don't hate men because you are you can't hate what you're attracted to. You should never talk negative about the things you want. That doesn't make sense. As a man, if you're attracted to women, you should never talk negative about women because that's what you want. So how can you attract that and then negatively put out there, right, uh, uh, um, you know, these complaints and issues all day long? So no, that's trauma-based spheres of conversation. And so a lot of this as well is agenda-based. We know that, that there are agendas of the elitists, there are agendas of the governments, there are agendas of all these people, and the people at the bottom are just complaining about the agendas of the puppet masters. And so we're not against each other, we're attracted to each other. You know what I mean? Like, you attracted to women, you ain't against women, you love women. You attracted to men, you're not against men, you love men. So we have to learn to realize that there's there's no real gender war, right? There is gender manipulation, right? There is manipul social this is psychological operations to manipulate the masses for the benefit of the masters. And so when we realize, like, damn, as long as you're still attracted to a woman, as long as you're still attracted to men. It ain't no gender wars. We good. <laughs> so a lot of people, um, you know, you've got famous couples like Will and Jada, you know, and, and Jada Pinkett Smith is always one who would say, you know, love is is like devastation. It is unconditional, you know, on our Red Table talks, you know, in, in your mind, what is love? Some people say um, love is a feeling. Sometimes people love you one day. They don't love you the next. Some people say um, you know, what, what's your whole take on this? Because what, what I'm getting at is that there's a rise in people saying, you know what, um, there's a free love movement out here, you know, happening all over the world where a lot of people, because of the rise of dating apps, Tinder, all of these things, social media, Instagram, it goes down in the DMs. A lot of people are not only dealing with one person at a time. It could be two or three and they're still deciding, you know, because there's so much choice like before, you might just meet one person in your village and, and that's it. But now people are so quick to give up on a relationship because they can see someone else who looks like a better candidate. So in your mind, um, you know, what, what is love? I mean, is it a real thing or is it just that it's just energy, man? People are, you know, you know what I'm trying to say? Um, love is, love is the most realest thing on the planet earth. This is why, you know, everything that we do is in response to love. Self-love is the reflection of all love. The relationship you have with yourself is the relationship you have with the world. Right? And love, I was taught that love is a duty. Right? So that if you love somebody, you have a duty towards that person. Right? And so it's not just a feeling. The feeling of love is the chemical reaction of love. It's a response to a certain amount of conditions that can create this feeling. So love can be manipulated in that sense, right? That is a biological reaction to, you know, these ideas. But the, the energy, the physics of love is life, right? I think that God built the world on love, 
sacred geometry is love, right? When trees are love, right? Nature is love. And so when we are in our nature, we are completely beings of love, right? We operate within that golden rule, right? Treat people how you want to be treated, right? Treat people good and do good to others, right? That's love. And then we have specific love that we respond towards our relationships. So when we say, I love you, we then take that, we take our love and we put it in a construct of a relationship so that we can build something out with another person, right? Because we relate to that person. We create a relationship with that person, right? And we have love within that relationship, right? And so to me, love is such a, a quantifiable but abstract thing, which is why everybody can have a different, you know, uh, response to it and a different definition of it. But love is one of life's only true vulnerable emotions. You know, it can take you blindsided, you know, and it can make you insane, right? <laughs> or it can bring you joy. So, but if we look at love as a duty, then we also have logical love because there's a lot of people who can respond to the emotion but can respond to the logic of love as well. And that's the duty of what we must do to do for each other if we say we love each other. If I say I love you, then I have a responsibility towards you as well, right? So therefore, I'm going to do good for you. I'm going to want good for you. I'm going to support you. I'm going to be there for you. Love is an oath, all right, that you can take with another person, right? That's why when a person does their vows, they're taking an oath to love each other through consequential circumstances. But you have to understand that just because you feel love for a person, you know, doesn't mean that you're always, you know, it's always going to feel like love, right? Love can sometimes feel like hate, you know, love can, can <laughs> feel so many different emotions, right? Cause love is like the rainbow. It got all the colors in it, right? right. It's the spectrum of emotions that we go through, right? So for me, like I, I answer it in such an abstract roundabout way because love is poetry, right? Love isn't logic, but it is logical. Right. But it's also illogical. Love is the is the one thing on the planet Earth that is everywhere, but the most elusive. Right. right. You can be in love with a person and you can love a person. You can have love for a person. So I think that life is love, you know, and if we had a world that was based more on love than hate, that's the secret technology. Right. That we're missing on this planet Earth is more love. You know what I'm talking about? more more so love that, more more that, definitely more life <laughs> now more life, more life, man. More life you know life. when i listen to your message you know like i said i used to go by the name of kemet prince one so you know deep into the kemetic sciences um you know shout out to dr phil valentine my early mentor um i shifted to infinite waters because i realized that um there's levels to this shit you know and, and it's way bigger than race. You know, a lot of like, like I always say, um, it's consciousness in my mind, because the more you dive deeper, the more you realize that, yes, um, everyone was born in a specific place for a reason, you know. And then when you begin to rise higher, you begin to realize that um, there's levels upon levels in terms of that. It doesn't matter who you are. Uh, you could be in somewhere in, in Greece or somewhere in Ethiopia and have the same level of consciousness because souls are in, in reincarnating into different bodies. And this is the trippy part of life where sometimes the people you're trying to reach uh, may not be receiving the message. It might be the ones that you're not reaching, that you're not trying to reach, that might appreciate even more. I've had people who have given me, you know, so much support I'm like, I would never imagine they would be watching my videos. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> I'm sure you've had the same, right? People were sending you messages. You're like, what? Yeah. You know? And, and, but that's the beauty of consciousness is, is for everybody. You know, right. I think that we, we, we kind of like think about our target audiences and who we feel like we're going to connect with. But once you put it out there, it's for everybody. Like it's universal. And I definitely have a lot of universal aspects of my message 
that anybody who tunes in will get a benefit from, especially my perspective. Right, right. Brother, you, you're, I don't, I don't want to cut into your time. You, you're so phenomenal. Please, please give um, the people, um, let them know where they can find your work. Let them know what you have going on. I know you've got upcoming events going on with Billy Carson yeah. and l- yeah. let us know what, you know. We have a few things. We're actually on tour. Uh, our tour starts May 4th um, on my birthday. The first, this is actually the first time I'm announcing this live to the world. As far as this tour, it's going to be at the Apollo Theater uh, in Harlem. So that's going to be the first tour stop. But it's going to be the highest level tour. I'm going to Toronto on the 2nd and 3rd. We have two back-to-back sold-out dates, um, which is beautiful. Um, Never done before. Financial literacy, you know, higher consciousness. It's never been done like this before. Uh, But then high-level conversations, that's the show. On the Earn Your Leisure Network on YouTube that I have partnership with, we all we over like 25 million views um, in less than a year, um, and we have a show with Joey Badass tomorrow about the spiritual awakening, mind, body, and spirit. That one's gonna be really good. Uh, so that prepare premieres tomorrow at 4:44 um, uh, Pacific Standard or uh, Eastern Standard Time, and then of course I have my book that you can find me on my uh, IG 19 underscore keys. Or if you want to find more of my messages that get put out there, you can go to my YouTube channel, 19 Keys, um, on YouTube. But, yeah, I just, you know, thank you for having me. And thank you for allowing me to talk to all the deep divers out there and everybody that's interested in this sort of conversation. Uh, I really want people to understand that, you know, um, I don't try to present myself as perfect. I don't try to present myself as the Messiah None of those things. I'm literally just like you, just a brother that's working to bring more of himself into reality to exude more of my own light and potential. And if you find value from that, thank you. Right. And if you don't, then I hope you do find places to where you do find value. Right. Because nobody should be, you know, uh, watching or feeding into things that they don't consider to be light. Right. Right. And it's devastating when you are giving consciousness to things that you feel like aren't right for you, right? So I want to put that message out there because there are so many people who who are always looking for what they don't like, right? And that is your mindset feeding itself toxicity. It's not the people that you're watching that's toxic. It's not them that's wrong. It's not them that's evil. It's not them that's none of that. It's your mind that doesn't know how to find light. And so you're always looking for darkness. You're always looking for issues. You're always looking for problems. And so you have a diseased mind that is plagued with the wrong thought patterns. And it's not until you change your environment, your exercise, your education, right, your execution, then you can change your reality. But thank you for having me on with the deep thank, dive. Thank you so I much. Th- th- thank thank you so much, brother. I appreciate your time. One more question. Where do you see yourself in the next 10 years? <sighs> Uh, the next 10 years, time speeds up so fast. The next 10 years is like the next <laughs> one year. To be honest. You know, uh, I see myself healthier. You know, I see myself being more mentally fit, physically fit, spiritually fit. You know, I see my family happy. You know, I, I see impact in the world um, by the multitudes. You know, I see more of me proving myself in front of the world that I am who I say I am, right? And inshallah, that has a positive effect on the world to create social impact and change, right? In the forms of creating institutions, creating new softwares that can help guide us into a better position, you know, to create the new earth that you talk about. So, you know, I I leave it up to, you know, me creating better habits to be a better person because, I can be happy as long as I become a better person. If I become a better person, then I serve the world in a better way. So that's where I see myself in 10 years. Brother 19 Keys, thank you so much for taking time. I know you're busy. I know you've got a lot to do. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you. All right, peace, brother. Thank Thank you. Peace. Take care.